work through a technical snafu, let us recover our sense of worship by repeating the call to worship. The kingdom of God is found in the most surprising places. The kingdom of God is hidden in the everyday things of life. The kingdom of God is small but very precious, great but easy to miss in all of life. The kingdom of God is here and now. Let us worship God who reigns over the kingdom. And let us as well reflect on our common humanity. Gracious God, we know you come to us before we find the courage to come to you. That it is in you that our little lives find their meaning. That your Holy Spirit is moving in our hearts and minds to lift us and restore us. Yet in this time of separation and even of isolation, we feel with the psalmist, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. We trust that you have called us, that you have predestined us, that you have conformed us to Christ's image. Yet we struggle to be at ease. Teach us to know and to say with confidence, if God is for us, who is against us? Won't the one who gave up for all of us his only son also give us everything else? Help us to turn away from all that is wrong, from self-pity and self-involvement, from all that is less than you are and that you ask. Lead us to seek and to find the gifts of your kingdom and to treasure them above anything else. For the sake of your greatest gift to us, Jesus our Lord. Friends, it is this Jesus who says, Your sins are forgiven you. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Generous God, Solomon asked you not for long life or riches or enemies delivered into his hands, but for understanding. Give us today in your word the understanding we need to see the wrongs around us and within us and the will we need to address them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Our Old Testament lesson today is continuing on the life of Jacob. And as I was preparing my scripture reading, I thought, when did I first hear about Jacob? And I realized it was when we were singing a chorus when I was wee wee that um, we were climbing Jacob's ladder. And then probably at the same time there was a flannel board lesson that had a they had Jacob on his stone pillow and this ladder going to heaven. Next thing I remember about him is that he stole his brother's birthright. Hmm. And then the next thing I learned was that his mother tricked him. He, she planned this in the Bible. Well, notice everything is out of sequence. And notice that when we, I, there was no connection to Abraham and Sarah. And so I beg you when you go home today or sometime during this week to start at the beginning and read the story of Jacob. And our lesson today is 
from Genesis 29, verses 15 to 28. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what work shall your wages be? Now, now we're finding the reason he went to Laban. Laban was his mother's brother, I guess his mother's um, brother. And since there was all this fuss about um, birthrights and Esau's reaction, they, they had to think up another story and send him off to Laban. Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you for seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give it to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to be but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laman, give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. And Laban gave his maid Zilpha to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what have you done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other, also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as his wife. story. Uh, else. <laughs> so the New Testament reading. In our call to worship this morning, we reference the kingdom of heaven. And in these passages from Matthew, we're going to refer to it as the kingdom of God. Jesus was uh, on a, in a boat, and there were so many people on the shore that he was preaching to them from the boat. And he started uh, talking about these parables because that's how he could teach them and they would understand some of his meanings of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God will be extended to all, even like the grain of a mustard seed he referred to. So here, let's see if we have some lessons from these many parables. He put before them another parable the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in the field. It is the smallest of seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Now in that country, it was the smallest of seeds. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed it with three measures of flour until it was all raised and leavened. Skipping to 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Which is, which is more valuable than anything. 
On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. And when it was full, they drew it ashore and sat down and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. Sort of thinking about judgment. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out his treasure of what is new and what is old. The word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. So Jacob is a person, as I think I've pointed out before, but I will point out again, in tremendous need of improvement. He's a liar. He's a trickster. He's a cheat. Getting cheated is perhaps part of how he internalizes the lessons that God is trying desperately to teach him. Jesus tries desperately to teach us in parables. And these parables are pretty fascinating. Uh, we have folk tales stuck in amongst the lessons. We have something about pearls. And while it's not important to us for understanding this particular parable or really similitude, um, in Hebrew tradition, pearls are <laughs> items culled from the Torah for our meditation. So it is possible that, um, and some interpreters have gone this road, that the merchant is somehow a stand-in for a scholar. Maybe, 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 but probably not. Merchants weren't viewed favorably. More to the point, these parables address people from every walk of life. People who are laborers in the fields as well as people who are scholars standing, as we've said many times, on the outskirts of these crowds that Jesus is talking to. To all of them, Jesus, back in the Sermon on the Mount, not very long ago in our text, a while ago otherwise, says this is the most important thing, and this is the sixth chapter and the 33rd verse. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things will be added to you as well. How any parable strikes me or seems to me or has meaning for me, and by me I mean each and every one of us, is the most important thing about that parable and not the sometimes tedious task of deciphering what every single part of it might be as if every parable were an allegory. They're not. They partake of a tradition that seeks to make us think by leaving blanks. They energize us because they provoke us, because they speak to us, both individually and very enigmatically. They insist that there is more, and that that more lies right beneath the surface of our day-to-day -day thinking and doing, and that we need to go and explore for. A working person and a scholar may very well be two very different people, and I will say that in my life I have been both those people, and just as Jesus made no preference between them, so far I don't see a ton of difference between them either. Neither is better and neither is worse than the other, but each one can be reached by this type of storytelling. So in between, from last week, the wheat and the tares, where the bad seed got sown in right amongst the good, and the end of this week's parables, there's a total of seven, 
and the big blank was where Jesus explained the wheat and the tares. That happened last week also. We come to, at the end to the story about the net. And I want to explain there were two kinds of nets in the fishing that these Galileans did. There were casting nets and there were dragging nets. This one is about a dragging net. A boat goes out, drops the net, which is anchored to ropes on the shore, on the top, and to weights on the bottom, and people on shore pull it in, and they collect absolutely everything that gets caught in it, and then, as Jesus says, sort it out on shore. Both that one and the wheat and tares are obviously apocalyptic par parables. They are about the end of time. The other ones aren't. They're folk-style tales and sayings. They're elaborate and very precise. Some of them are only a verse long. And what they seek to reveal is how life works and what it's worth in the space of those few verses. They will slowly, because God works slowly, as witness good old Jacob, they will slowly change how we understand the word of Christ, the spirit of God, and the nature of reality. And that change is a saving change inside us and for the sake of the creation. To decisively opt for the kingdom of God, which is what Jesus is seeking us to provoke, is what Jesus is provoking us to do, to actively choose what means the most for us, and to then live into it, is what these parables are about beneath all the tiny meanings and tiny interpretations. Yes, we are dismayed at the presence of injustice in our world. But the first work of every Christian and the continuing work all our lives long of every Christian is on ourselves, is on how we love, is on how we treat God's world. You see, God is in love with us and especially so as we recover and begin to live out the manner in which God made us, as we conform more and more to the image of God that is inside us, and so begin to live well. It's the work of every Christian to tend not one garden, the Garden of Eden, but two gardens. We are also meant to tend our interior garden, to care about it and to work on it. And when we do, we are well. And when we do, the world is well. When we are in constant readiness to be fertile and fruitful for the sake of God, not just we, but the world is well. And the meaning that God has installed into the world, the meaning that is the actual similitude in the parable of the treasure and the parable of the pearl is realized. You see, that laborer found something he really, really, really wanted, and he went back and gave up everything that he had been and done. He actually had <clears throat> a conversion of life from all the ways he had lived to this treasure is it. And the merchant had exactly the same experience. Neither of them started out looking for what they found, but when they found it, they realized, that's it. I'm all in. The point of these parables beneath all the possible interpretations is a simple one. When we join Christ in discipleship, we discover slowly like yeast, slowly like the growth of mustard, but also instantly like, whoa, that's really different. And we change, and we commit to change, and we commit to continual change. Friends, we've lost a person just yesterday, just like that, a person who had this experience. When we lost Buzz, we lost a man who, whatever had been important in his early life, changed it. When Buzz met Betsy, she became the most important person in his life. When Buzz had a family, they became the most important people in his life. When Buzz went on to serve his country, it became the most important thing in his life. 
when Buzz in his retirement came here and served this church tirelessly, it was because it was the most important thing in his life. All these things he discovered by encounter, and their importance grew in his life through all his life, and he cultivated all of these things importance in his life. A stable man, a moral man, a hardworking man, and a committed man, he was on the road to Jesus and to his maker where he has now gone through these activities of life because they all pointed to the same thing. That loving and loving well is the single most important thing we can do in this life. And it is the thing Jesus calls us to do. Buzz served. He served his wife. He served his family. He served his country. He served this church, and thus he found exactly who Buzz Hennepin was, is, and always shall be. We will dearly miss Buzz, but he is also an example that we should hold in our own lives, an example of steadiness and of discipleship and of devotion that we should and will continue to admire. Sorry. And so, because I'm out of them, I'll give the last words to the Apostle Paul. And this is from the letter to the Philippians. It's the fourth chapter, the eighth and ninth verses. You know them, buzz lift them. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things you have learned and received and heard and seen. I'm going to rob Paul and say, in buzz. And the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Will you please stand as you are able and join me in the affirmation of faith? We believe in God the Creator, who created and is creating everything, the universe, the world, the plants and animals, and us, each of us, individual and beloved of God. We believe in God the Christ, who saved and is saving everything, the universe, the world, the plants and animals, and us, each of us unique, individual, and beloved of the Christ. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who guided and is guiding everything, the universe, the world, the plants and animals, and us, each of us, unique, individual, and beloved of the Spirit. We believe that this one God in three persons is present among us, working directly in our lives and the lives of all who are born into this world, striving to bring us back into harmony with all creation and with God, forgiving, healing, touching everyone, never rejecting any who willingly receive this freely offered gift of love and grace and eternal life. Amen. Please be seated. And we will come to our time of concerns and joys, and of course, at the top of them, I am going to say again, in case you have missed by any other communication, dear friends, that yesterday Buzz Hennepin went to his maker after a fairly long illness that he did find discouraging, but that he always found hope inside of. Survived by Betsy and his boys and his daughter and their spouses, the family is with Betsy now. Um, the family asks for some privacy and some space. Betsy insists she does not need food and we must believe her. And she welcomes your prayers and of course your outreach of love. 
there are no immediate plans. When any plans are made, I will keep you informed and I will be involved in those plans, so I will be able to keep you informed. There are others that we need to pray for. We need to continue to pray for Edna, for Dick Register, for Wilbur Sigvordson, for the many people that we have named week on week, the ones we name in our hearts, the ones who have not brought their prayers here, but for whom we know there needs to be prayer. We need to go on praying. We need to accept the blessing of God in all the tosses and turns and changes and fortunes and misfortunes of life, understanding that in all of that, there is an innerness of God's creation that is being born in each of us and growing in each of us. So even as we mourn, let us remember that in the morning there is joy. Now I'll ask you to join me in a prayer that maybe is appropriate because of the circumstances with Buzz, Buzz but that I did set in here prior to Buzz's passing. Almighty God, our Creator and Redeemer, we praise you for all your wonderful works, for the beauty and the bounty of the world around us, for everything you have given us so richly to enjoy. We bless you for our own creation as women and men made in your image, with minds to know you, hearts to love you, and wills to obey you. Accept, O God, this our praise and thanksgiving, and to your name be honor and glory forever. Amen. We thank you especially for those who work to sustain our nation and its community in health and safety for doctors and nurses and aides, for police and firefighters and EMTs, for essential workers in all walks of life, for those who grow and transport and prepare and serve food. Help us to live gratefully and not grudgingly as full responsible members of our human family and society. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, who taught us to pray his more perfect prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Open our eyes to you, O God, and to all we receive every day from your hand. Help us to focus on what you call us to do today, to open our eyes, to open our hearts, to open our minds for the sake of compassion and generosity. And so I will call for the offer. Accept, O Lord, these gifts of our time, our talents, and our treasure. However great or however small, may they and we be used to grow your kingdom. May our mustard seeds grow into mighty bushes where the birds of the air may hide. Amen. And now, friends, I will charge you in this way. Take the smallest seed and produce life. Add yeast to the bread of life and it will grow. Find the hidden treasure in your life. Invest all you have in living for God. Cast wide your net and haul in the catch. All these blessings are yours, with more, from God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, today and always. Amen. And now, friends, I entrust you to that same God and to the message of God's grace a message that is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance with all who are sanctified. 
Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and every day. Amen.